section summary for uh, the pre-calculus book from OpenStack, section 1.1. Uh, the basic idea of this section is you learn about functions. You learn what they are, learn how to get comfortable with them, learn to answer some questions about them, learn some vocabulary about them. In short, a function is a mathematical machine. So you can kind of think about this image as sort of your uh, what you think about when you think about a function. Uh, a doubling machine would be a perfectly good function. So for example, I could put the number 3 into my doubling machine, and the number 6 would come out. And I could put the number, I don't know, negative 4 into my doubling machine, and then negative 8 would come out. And this is a good way to think about functions, to think about them really abstractly, although rarely you will see functions presented this way. Um, nine times out of ten, you'll see this specific function represented like this. And in this notation, what you need to know is that the name of the function is f. The input to this function, this machine, is the x. It's what goes inside these parentheses right here. And then what's on the other side here is the output from the function. So essentially this is saying you put something in that I'll call x and what would come out would be 2x. So a true statement representing the top line of this flow chart would be f of 3 equals 6. This would say if you put 3 into this machine f, what comes out is 6. Keeping straight the inputs and the outputs here um, is really important. It's probably the most common thing people mess up. Uh, answer a couple questions with that. If we stick with this function f of x, I can really ask you to do two different things. I can ask you to evaluate something like f of 4 and then I could ask you this is one question the other common question you'll get is to solve f of x equals 4. These two guys look pretty similar especially if you ignore the English but they're actually very different. This one is telling you that the input is 4 and it asks you to find the output. This one is telling you that the output is 4 and it's asking you to find the input. And that's probably the most common thing people mess up when they're first learning functions is switching up the inputs and the outputs. Remember, the input is what is inside these parentheses next to the f. You're putting it into this machine here. So when I'm asked to evaluate f of 4, all I got to do is think about what will come out of my doubling machine, because that's the machine that I'm talking about in this example, uh, when I put 4 into it. And you'd be like, well, 4 doubled is 8. Yeah, that's true. You could just think about it that way. Maybe a better way to think about it is this is kind of the blueprint of my function. So when I put x in, what comes out is 2x. So anything else I put in, I would just be changing the x into that thing. So if I want f of 4, all I got to do is change all the x's into 4's. I get f of 4 equals 2 times 4. And you're like, wait, isn't that 8? I was able to figure that out. I can double 4 in my head. I'm way smarter than you. Okay, that's fine. That'll work great for this example, but maybe you can picture a really complicated function that it would help to have a method for solving. So this will always work. So that's the first type of question you'll see. The second type of question you'll see will look really similar, and it's this one right here. And what this is telling you is that the output is 4. So again, you refer back to your blueprint up here, and you say, well, the output is 2x. So this problem is telling me that 2x equals 4. So what I have here is an equation that I need to solve. When you're solving equations, you're isolating the x. Um, in this case, I divide both sides by 2 and get that x equals 2. So my solution up here would be 8. My solution down here would be 2. So that's how you evaluate functions and how you solve functions, which will be a couple of the most frequent things that you do. A couple more notes on functions before I move on. In order to be a function, there's this really important criteria that doesn't seem very important right now, but it'll be really important. It'll come up over and over again. It's really important that you understand it because this is just one example of a function, but maybe you can picture there's infinitely many functions, lots of different things I could do to numbers, but not all of them are functions. So you have to be a little bit careful. In order to be a function, every input must have exactly one output. It cannot be the case that you have some machine and you put the number four, for example, into it and out comes an eight and a 10 or something like that. That can't happen, that's not a function. A function must have one defined output for every single input. So that's what I'm saying in this important criteria here. I'm using a little bit of vocabulary in this criteria here. I'm assuming that you know that the domain is the set of numbers that you're allowed to put into the function and the range is the set of numbers that can come out of the function. Wait, there's numbers I couldn't put in the function? What number could I not double? Well, actually, you can double any number you want, but for a different function, you might get into trouble. There might be numbers that you cannot put into the machine and get an output out of it. And that would be the, the numbers that you can put in is what's called the domain. 1.2, we'll talk a lot more about domain and range, so I'll leave it there for now. Uh, a couple more things to talk about. One-to-one. -one. Um, some functions are one-to-one, -one, some are not. The idea of being one-to-one -one is kind of similar to this important criteria about here about being a function. This criteria says that any one input cannot have more than one output corresponding with it. Uh, what it means to be one-to-one -one for a function 
is that it cannot be the case that you have multiple inputs that have the exact same output. Wait, those sounded pretty similar. Maybe I can do an example that makes that make more sense. Here's another machine. I'm gonna call it G of X so you don't confuse it with F of X up here. And this is the squaring machine. And I won't represent it with a flow chart like this or with a table or any other method that you'll see in this chapter. I'll represent it with the equation the way you'll see things most frequently. G of X equals X squared. I can graph this function. And the way I graph it, I'm assuming you know how to graph X, Y points on a coordinate plane. This point right here is one, one. This point right here is two, four. Um, the reason this point right here is 2, 4 is the x coordinate is 2 and the y coordinate is 4. When you're graphing a function, all you're doing is graphing input output pairs. So the reason this point is on my graph is because when I put 2 into the squaring function, 4 comes out. Similarly, when I put negative 1 into the squaring function, positive 1 comes out. So when x is negative 1, y is positive 1. That's all you're doing when you're graphing functions. Note that this function right here, it's a perfectly good function. When I put in one number, exactly one number comes out. It's not like three squared is both nine and negative nine. That's not true, I don't have to worry about that. It satisfies this criteria. However, this function is not one to one. Because a function is not one to one if multiple inputs yield the same output. In this case, two and negative two, for example, would yield the exact same output of four. So this function right here is not one to one. It is a function, it's not one to one. Uh, two, two more things and then I'll call this good. Uh, I think it's easier to think about what is not a function rather than what is a function and what is not one-to-one -one rather than what is one-to-one. -one. So here's a little bit of a summary there. Something is not a function if there's any one input that has multiple outputs. Equivalently, if the graph fails the vertical line test. So the vertical line, line test is a handy way for you to figure out if a function or if a relation is a function. Uh, what the vertical line test says is to pass the vertical line test, any vertical line you draw can intersect your graph in at most one spot. Put differently, if there's any vertical line that you can draw that intersects your graph in more than one spot, like that vertical line I just drew did, what that means is this thing's not a function. And that makes sense if you think about what graphing means and how we graph functions. This is saying that for whatever this input is, whatever this x coordinate is, there's three different y values, which are the outputs. So I have one input with multiple outputs. I'm failing this important criteria. Um, I couldn't think of a whole lot of examples of how you would have something that's not a function because you're going to be dealing with functions. But I guess like a plus or minus, something like that. If x is equal to 5, for example, then I'm saying the y coordinate is 3 plus 10 and it's also 3 minus 10. And that can't happen. That is not a function. When you have a function, you can ask the question, is your function one-to-one? -one? A function is not one-to-one -one if there exist multiple inputs that have the same output, like I had up here. Um, equivalently, there's this thing called the horizontal line test. And to fail the horizontal line test, much like to fail the vertical line test, there has to be only one, or all you need to do is find one horizontal line that intersects your graph in more than one spot. Here's a horizontal line that intersects my graph in more than one spot. What that means is that this graph, this function, is not one-to-one. -one. And it makes sense. Whatever this x-coordinate is and this x-coordinate and this x-coordinate all have the same height associated with them. And the height, the y-coordinate, is the output. So I have multiple inputs with one output. Therefore, I'm not one-to-one. -one. Um, I think those are the most important things in this section. Before I quit this video, I want to show you one thing out of the book. Um, the book is saying, hey, it'll be a good idea to graph functions. Yeah, that's true. I agree. Um, what if you don't have a graphing calculator handy? It's a good idea to have some kind of basic functions memorized. So they're going to give you five of these toolkit functions. And just memorize that this specific graph looks like this. And I don't know why this doesn't continue. It really should. There should be arrows on both sides going up here. But for whatever reason, the book didn't do that. Um, what if it's not x squared but x cubed? That graph looks like this. Memorize it. What if it's not x squared or x cubed but 1 over x? That graph looks like this. These are three of the more important graphs that you'll kind of just want to have memorized what they look like. You can understand why they look like this, or you can just memorize it. There's a few more that are a little simpler that won't show up quite as much. The constant graph, if you have your machine f of x just equals some number, your graph will look like this. If you have kind of a boring machine f of x equals x, the output to the machine is the exact same as the input. That graph would look like this. And finally, if you have f of x equals the absolute value of x, that graph would look like this. This is not meant to be every graph, it's just some of the basic graphs that you can think of as sort of building blocks 
that we'll build upon in this chapter. So it's not a bad idea to introduce them in this section. That's the end of the quick summary.